Harris Creek, how we doing? Oh, so good. Hey, if you got a Bible, get it out. If you got pen and paper, open up your notes app. We're going to learn some scripture today. Uh, hey, if you don't know me, I'm Drew. I'm one of the pastors here, and I grew up in the great state of Arkansas. Yeah, yes, there are other states besides Texas. Most Texans don't know that. Uh, but yeah, Arkansas borders uh, Texas. And I have found as I've lived here that Texans have some stereotypes they think of when they think of Arkansans. Can you guys just tell me a few? Just say them out loud. What's that? Hillbilly. Hillbilly. Yeah, that's, that's fair. What else? Woo pig. Woo pig suey. Come on. That's true. Usually you get a no shoes, no shirt, no problem. That's an Arkansas thing. Like hunting, fishing. Yeah, so there's lots of stereotypes about Arkansans. Marry your cousin, that's one. Uh, uh, that one's not as true. Uh, but uh, yeah, those are all mostly true. And so I grew up in a small town in Arkansas about south, uh, hours southeast of Little Rock. And in that town, it was a farming community. All the stereotypes are true there, and especially of my neighbors. So we lived on a dirt road in town. I didn't know that was possible, but we did. Lived on a dirt road in town, and my neighbors lived across a field from us. So not just like right next door to us, but across a field. And just about every day, you could go outside and you'd smell a stench in the air, and you'd be like, what is that? And you could look across, and they would have something hanging in their yard that they were skinning. I mean, this is every day. I'm like, I didn't know there were that many animals uh, to be killed, but there were. And so they actually had a son about my age. And so we grew up together. He was one of those friends, you may, may have had one of these friends where you're friends most of the time. Uh, and so we're, we'd be playing together, we'd be friends, and all of a sudden he would do something or I would do something, and then we would be enemies, right? And so we just went back and forth with that as we grew up. Fast forward to junior high, and we're riding the bus together every day on the way home from school. And this friend was a little bit bigger than me, and he started to bully me. And so day after day, he'd bully me and I'd get home. So finally, one day I'd had enough and I told my dad when I got home, I said, hey, I don't wanna ride the bus anymore. He keeps bullying me. My dad, who's a pastor, would not normally give this advice, but he said, hey, you have my permission to punch him in the face. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, here we go. So that night, my wheels start spinning, right, as a, as a junior hire. And I'm thinking about, like, man, do I hold my thumb under here? Do I like, do like this? I decided I was gonna punch him in the throat so it didn't hurt my hand. Like, I'm, I'm picturing the entire thing happening. And so I barely sleep at all. The next morning, I go to school, you know, period after period. I'm looking for him in the hallway. I'm planning my attack. I'm like, when I'm going to get on the bus, I'm actually decided, I decided to do it when I got off the bus so I wouldn't get in trouble on the bus. And so uh, that's what I actually want to talk to you today is about courage, about the courage that it took to face uh, my fears. Uh, I guess I should tell you, you guys want to know what happened? So the last bell rings, my heart is racing. And I go out to the bus stop, I go out and I get on the bus, and he wasn't there. He didn't ride the bus that day. And so Chad, if you're watching this, you turned out to be a great guy. Uh, please don't beat me up, okay? So uh, yeah, but I wanna talk just, not just today about a moment of courage, but moments of courage, a lifetime of courage uh, that comes from faithfulness. And we're going to look at this amazing story in Acts chapter 6 and 7 of Stephen the martyr. If you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles, we're going to look at Acts chapter 6 and 7. Today we're going to see a picture of what bold and courageous faithfulness looks like. What bold and courageous faithfulness looks like. I think it's very helpful on the onset for us to define what exactly faithfulness is. So if you're a note taker, write this down. Faithfulness is to be steadfast and affection or allegiance, to be steadfast in affection or allegiance. We're going to see how the steadfastness of Stephen in little moments prepared him for the big moments. And we're going to see how faithfulness enables followers of Christ to step in, how faithfulness empowers his followers to step up, and finally today we're going to see how faithfulness emboldens followers of Jesus to step out. You know, in America, we have a hard time when we read Acts understanding what it was truly like for them to be persecuted for their faith. You know, we have comfortable lives. It's easy to be a Christian in 2022 here where we live. And I think oftentimes comfort is the enemy of courage. Comfort is the enemy of courage. Our lack of need oftentimes equals a lack of faith in our lives. You know, we would like to think that if someone put a gun to our heads, and asked us if we were willing to die for our faith, if we love Jesus, that it would be an easy yes. But most of the time, we just can't even answer that because our faith is so untested. We don't know how we would answer that. And even more, 
You know this is true on social media. We surround ourselves with people who agree with us, who pe- with people who are for us, with people who think and act just like us. And many of the times, and I fall prey to this myself, we just need to start getting more comfortable with not being liked. You know, think of John 15 where Christ said, hey, you're gonna be hated for what you believe. And that's a hard passage for us to understand. And as JP said last week, so many of us are just having to learn how to not find the approval of other people, to find our worth in the approval of other people. It's what God thinks about us that matters. And so today, we're gonna see in this story that Stephen was one who certainly did not live for the approval of man, and it ended up costing him his life. As we're gonna read, he was ready when the moment came because of his lifetime of faithfulness. So as I said, we're gonna be in chapters six and seven of Acts. To recap where we've been in this series, Uh, We've been going through these significant stories in the book of Acts. So Jesus has died, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. And before he did that, he created the the church, the local church, which is still in existence today. That's how you're in these seats. And he told them to go and make disciples across the ends of the earth. And so this is Luke's orderly account of all the stories that happened in the book of Acts. Week one, uh, we learned about Pentecost, the, the, the descending of the Holy Spirit onto the earth, and the church was established then and Peter became the head of the church. Weeks two, week two, we looked at Acts two and what the, le- the early church looked like, what they did, how they met, how they gathered. And we found out that they shared the gospel like Jesus was coming back at any moment and found that challenge for us. And then week three, we saw, a sto- we saw a story of healing and the power of the Holy Spirit on full display. And at this point, the church has gained tons of momentum and thousands and thousands of people are coming to the faith. And then last week, JP talked about a slight pause in the momentum of the church, this cautionary story of Ananias and Sapphira and how their need to manage perception caused them to sin and their disobedience actually ended up killing them. So this week, we have another death story, two death stories in a row, except in this one, it wasn't obe- a disobedience that killed Stephen, it was obedience. So some backstory on Stephen. Stephen was actually the first documented martyr in scripture. He's the first documented martyr in scripture. And we're gonna see in chapter six that he was a deacon. And he was a man full of faith, it says, and the Holy Spirit. He was one of the seven chosen by the 12 apostles to take care of the widows and the distribution of food. And that's what a deacon was in the early church. A lot of times in present day, we think of deacons as overseers or people who make decisions. No, but a deacon back then was just someone who served. The first half of Acts up until this point has been about Peter, this giant in our faith. And then the last half of Acts, as we're gonna see, is actually about Paul. And we're we're gonna read about Paul today who's known as Saul. In fact, we're gonna see that he's standing there holding the coats of those stoning Stephen when he's persecuting the early church. You can see here in this Rembrandt painting from 1625, you have Paul up there at the very top holding the coats of the Sanhedrin as they stone Stephen. This is a well-documented story in Christian history because it was really this story that set the trajectory of Christianity to all over the world. It was like, just think about if you like stepped on an anthill and they just scatter everywhere. That's what happened in the story of Stephen. It's also well-documented because martyrdom throughout Christian history has been the ultimate way, it's seen as the ultimate way to show your faithfulness to God. And then one last interesting note as we get started, the, the Greek word for witness is martis. M-A-R-T-Y-S, which is where we get the word martyr from. And we're gonna see in this text why, why Stephen was seen as such a faithful witness to Christ. So turning your Bibles, we're gonna be in Acts chapter six, beginning in verse one. Acts chapter six, beginning in verse one, it says this. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the, the, the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, or maybe Timon and his friend Pumbaa, I don't know, Uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. 
So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So to recap here, we have the early church, and it's exploding. And they're adding to their numbers daily those who are being saved. And the apostles were overwhelmed with ministry. They couldn't do it all. And so they find seven faithful Greek-speaking deacons among them to aid in the distribution to the widows that were Greek-speaking that were being overlooked. This type of leadership should be uh, very uh, normal to us. We read this in uh, Exodus 18, and that's a model we use around here for our shepherds. They couldn't do it all, so they uh, got these other people to step in and help. And they laid hands on these guys, and they prayed for them. And they sent them out, and it says the word of God spread, the number of disciples increased rapidly. So it was the faithfulness of these deacons that aided in the spreading of the gospel. And that leads me to point one. Point one today is faithfulness enables followers of Christ to step in. Faithfulness enables followers of Christ to step in. You know, we don't know much about what Stephen and the other six were doing uh, before they were called to be deacons, but we can assume a few things. One, we do know in verse three that they were full of the spirit and wisdom. So when you're looking for someone to help, find someone that's full of the spirit and wisdom. And then secondly, they were chosen, I think, because they were already ministering to people. And we know this to be true. When, we are, when you're looking for help, when we're at Harris Creek looking for help, we're gonna find those people who are already helping. And the same is true for you guys. You know, I, I about four months ago became a truck guy. I got a truck. And I started noticing that now that I have a truck, people like to use me for my truck. And so the more I do that, the more people go, hey, Drew has a truck. And so the same would be true here. As they're serving, as they're loving on people, the apostles are gonna look up and go, hey, who is already doing this? And we learn here that it's just, imp- just as important to care for people as it is to preach the gospel. They're one and the same. And how do we know this? Let's look at verse six. It says, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So here we have this traditional early church commissioning going on. There was such great importance placed on this job. It was a God-ordained job, and it was not lesser than. So them serving these people was not lesser than. The apostles commissioned this group knowing it allows for the needs of the community to be met. That's the gospel that's advanced in both word and deed. It says that in Colossians 3.17. Because, this is true, when you meet someone's physical needs, it enables them to see their spiritual needs as well. When you meet someone's physical needs, it enables them to see their spiritual need as well. And this allowed the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. And what happens when they use their gift? The entire body is way more obedient. Let's look at verse seven. It says, so the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So what do we see here? We see that when the church multiplied, it was because it was giving ministry away. This is a key part of our mission statement here at Harris Creek, that we wanna empower members for service. And that's why we talk about it all the time. And so I wanna tell you, if you're on the sidelines of ministry and you're waiting to be asked to, to be on the team, you're doing it the wrong way. You just gotta get in the game. Take a small step of obedience and find where to ser- somewhere to serve and serve. We have about 2,500 members here at Harris Creek and about 500 of you are serving. And so we would love to boost that number a lot higher. I'd love for every person in this room who can hear my voice online, uh, if you're a part of Harris Creek, find a way to serve. Now, of that 500, I just wanted to highlight a few people who are crushing it. Uh, there is Bo with the grass. And actually, I mentioned Bo in the first service, and someone told me after that he's actually not here today because he's also serving someone else uh, by mowing their grass. But Bo comes all the time and takes care of our grass in the 100 degree heat, passionate about making sure our grass looks good and serves in that way. You know, I think of Brady, who takes care of our baptistry and comes up here and helps with building projects. I think of Jennifer and her team who are serving the orphans in Waco and the underprivileged. And the list could go on. I could name lots of people. So my uh, ask is this, just that you would join all of those people. Don't wait on a sign from God. You know, we have three boys, and our youngest is actually adopted. And uh, people sit down with me all the time and ask, man, what was it that like, led you to adopt? And they want to hear that story. And I'll tell you, it wasn't a burning bush like God told us to adopt moment at first. 
We simply felt a nudge to do that and we got the paperwork from this agency in Fort Worth and I stuck it in my backpack and then it stayed in my backpack for a while. And then my wife and I were on our breakfast date one day and we just decided, hey, let's get the form out, let's fill it out, let's send it in and let's take a step of obedience. And then that led to another form, actually countless forms. And then we go to Fort Worth and we go to the first uh, interest meeting where they talk about adoption and, we, and we, our hearts kind of got around it. And then eventually two years later, after just a process of our hearts getting around adoption, we finally had this passion for adoption and were able to adopt our son. And so it didn't start with this big God-sized moment, it just started with a faithful step. And so it doesn't even have to be something you're passionate about. Maybe it just means you see a need and you meet the need. And God may even awaken that passion in you as you meet those needs. So if you're in, I'm gonna say it again, if you're waiting for an invitation to serve, this is it right now. Go do it, feel empowered to serve. All right, moving on. So we're gonna see what happens next in Stephen in this next section of scripture. As he faithfully steps in, God is going to empower him to step up in a big way. We're gonna get back in the text now. Acts chapter six, now starting in verse eight. Let's go there. It says this in verse eight. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the Sanhedrin of the Freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Naz Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Okay, here we go. This is where it's getting good. Stephen is doing his ordinary ministry and meanwhile, God is calling him to something extraordinary. We learn that Stephen is not just a man now full of faith in the Holy Spirit, but now he's full of God's grace and power. If you wanna underline that in the scriptures, he's full of grace and power. And he's doing great signs and wonders among the people, it says in verse eight. And this does not sit well with the religious leaders of the day. So what do they do? They cancel him. They stir up a mob, they bring false witnesses against him, and they bring him before the Sanhedrin, who at the time were the keepers of the law. And that brings me to point two. Faithfulness empowers followers of Christ to step up. Faithfulness empowers followers of Christ to step up. Let's look back at the text. There's some things that I want us to notice here today. The Jewish leaders are furious at Stephen for the same reasons that they killed Christ. He was challenging their traditions, their customs of Mosaic law, and he was proclaiming that Jesus alone could forgive their sins, and they hated this. And then in verse 10, it says they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And I want us to notice here that uh, God has empowered Stephen with the wisdom directly from the Holy Spirit. And Paul reminds us, that, reminds us this is gonna happen in Romans 8, 11. Romans 8, 11 says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living, is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you, give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. So we're gonna see here that Stephen is full of this very power, this Holy Spirit given power that man cannot stand up against. And his courage, all of his courage came from that power. And this is what gave him the boldness to go from Stephen the deacon to Stephen the martyr, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And he was empowered, not just in that moment, but because of years of faithfulness in the background. Years of faithfulness of serving and loving and caring and being faithful. You know, something I think God wants to root out of us in Waco, Texas, and in America, uh, is our obsession with influence. We are obsessed with influence and how to get it. I think the idea that influence has actually became a, become a label and a noun 
is proof of enough of that. And I am not here today, if you're an influencer watching or, or uh, you want to be one, uh, I'm not here today to say that those platforms and audiences aren't God-given. You can certainly use those things for his glory. But when we try to grasp and influence the wrong ways, we get in trouble. And we're gonna see here that the reason Stephen was given influence was because it started with him being a servant. That's how you get influence in the kingdom of God, is you start by serving. And Jesus said as much in Matthew chapter 20, verse eight. It says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the application here is pretty simple. It's just to live out what it says in Micah 6, 8. I think Stephen was just simply doing justice and he was loving mercy and he was walking humbly with God. And we're gonna see what it got him. It got him canceled, it got him killed. And that's a possible outcome of faithfulness for all of us. Are we willing to risk it all for the sake of Christ? Are we willing to speak up for the marginalized people in our day? Are we willing to step in with courage? Are we willing to bring peace and shalom to a world where there is desperate need for peace? And this is the question I have to ask myself every day as a recovering people pleaser. It's, am I truly willing to allow the Holy Spirit to empower me to speak truth when the world loves what is false? They love what is false. And what's, that gonna, what's gonna happen if I do that? The world may hate me. And, and what if I'm not well liked? What if I don't have a ton of followers on social media because of that? Am I okay with that? And I wanna tell you, Stephen would have been okay with that. Stephen was okay with that. And so what we're gonna read next is actually the climax of the story. It's gonna show us how Stephen was emboldened by God for the sake of the gospel, which is our last point. Faithfulness emboldens followers of Christ to step out. Faithfulness emboldens followers of Christ to step out. We're gonna jump back in the text now, uh, now chapter seven, and we're actually gonna begin in verse 51. And you may notice that we're skipping 50 whole uh, verses of scripture. And so I'm gonna summarize that for us. Stephen basically lies, lays out to the Sanhedrin the entire story of the Old Testament. So we're gonna find out that Stephen is actually a very studied uh, individual. He spent time in the word of God, and he's gonna give them the greatest hits of the Old Testament. He's gonna talk about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's gonna talk about Joseph and his story. He's gonna talk about slavery in Egypt. He's gonna talk about Moses and how God's people continually went for, to, towards God and away from God and back towards God. And what he's gonna do is here, he's, he's simply reminding the Sanhedrin that they are actually lining up directly with their rebellious ancestors. He's saying, hey, you're doing the very same things they did. And he's telling them, hey, you killed the very savior that came to release you from the bondage of sin and slavery. You killed him. So here we go. We're gonna pick up in verse 51 of chapter seven. And it says this. You stiff-necked people with your uncircumcised hearts and ears. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those predicted they even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed into him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Man, what a powerful story of courage we read there. He tells them to simply just repent and turn to Christ, and he blames them for the death of Jesus. At this, they become furious and they gnash their teeth. I don't know what gnashing your teeth is. It does not sound good to me. But we see this vivid picture of, this, of the execution of Stephen where they even cover their ears and they drag him out of the city and they stone him to death. Some things that I want us to notice uh, in this text. Firstly, 
If you'll look at verse 55, it says, Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit. Luke is reminding us yet again where Stephen's power comes from. And it does not come from himself. It comes from Jesus. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Secondly, as Stephen is being killed, he sees heaven open and he sees the Son of Man, if you want to underline Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God. The only other reference in the New Testament other than Christ calling himself the Son of Man is John in Revelation 1. And Son of Man is a title of humility. Uh, it's a title of humanity for Christ. It's saying, hey, Christ was actually a man who was here on earth. And so this is yet another way we see Stephen trying to reach these Jews that killed Christ. He's trying to, even in his dying breath, tell them who Jesus was. And then lastly, something I never noticed before uh, in reading this text, the text says that Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. In every other text in scripture, what do we hear? We, we hear that he's sitting. And in this moment, Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. And why is that? I'm gonna take some creative license here, but I think Luke is just trying to say, hey, Jesus wants people who are gonna put the cross before them. He's gonna, he wants people who are willing to take up their own cross and follow. And then it's as if he's standing there to receive his son, to say, hey, well done my good and faithful servant. And then lastly, verse 60, one more thing I want us to notice is that Stephen doesn't even blame them for what they're doing. He says, God, do not hold this against them. So this is just an aside for all of us. I think the ability to forgive is a huge indicator of a faithful believer. Your ability to forgive, my ability to forgive is a huge indicator of a faithful believer. We see it in Stephen. And if you don't remember anything else today, Here's what I want you to know today. It is the little moments of faithfulness in Stephen's life that led to a big moment of faithfulness. It was the little moments that led to the big moment. When Stephen needed boldness, the Spirit gave it to him. And Jesus said that that would happen in Matthew 10, 19 through 20. Jesus said, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Man, what an encouragement that one is. He was just allowing God to speak through him. It was his faithfulness throughout his entire life that allowed God in that moment to speak exactly how he wanted to speak and to do exactly what he wanted to do. So that's the question that we all have to ask this morning. How can we have the boldness that Stephen had? How can we have the boldness that Stephen had? That Stephen had. And I just want to tell you, it's kind of a churchy answer. It's we have to remind ourselves of the gospel of Jesus. We have to remind ourselves that Christ died and that he rose on our behalf. And it was nothing that we did to earn that. And it's then and only then that we roll up our sleeves and we get to work. And we start being faithful as we, as we model what Stephen did and what Jesus did. Guys, being a believer should cost us something. And I'm afraid in today's age in America, it doesn't cost us a lot. So we gotta find some ways for it to cost us something so that we can be found faithful in the end. I love this quote from Martin Luther as we close. It just, he says, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. And man, that's true. We need to hear it every day because we forget it every day. So in summary, faithfulness enables followers to step in and empowers followers to step up and faithfulness emboldens followers of Christ to step out, out of the safety and the comfort of our lives. You know, I want to close with this today. I just want to look back at Stephen's life. And so you have this guy, I don't know what he did for a living, uh, but he was faithful in it. So he did something to make money, and yet he was serving in his church. And year after year, I could just see him proving faithful as a servant in his church. And then when they look for someone uh, to meet a need, he's there to meet that need. And he steps in. And then we fast forward a little bit in his life. And in a moment where he needs to step out in boldness, Christ gives him that strength. And so then you see next that Stephen is going around and doing miracles and signs and wonders for the kingdom of God. And what does that get him? It gets him put on trial before the Sanhedrin. And in a moment where he needs even more boldness, he's empowered to step out and say, hey, do whatever you want. I'm proclaiming this guy named Jesus. He loves you. And then in his dying breath, 
He's continuing to be faithfulness. And he, and he says, what does he say? Hey, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, all of that should sound really familiar to us, should it not? Because there's another man. And Stephen modeled exactly what he did. It's almost if, as if Stephen just followed Christ around from a very early age to see a man who was a carpenter, who lived a life of faithfulness. And then after 30 years, he's called up into ministry and he goes and he does signs and wonders. And he proclaims that I love you, I love all of you. And you don't have to live the way that our ancestors did. You can receive the grace and mercy that Christ offers. You can see, receive it from me. And what happens? It angers the Sanhedrin. He goes on trial before them and they end up finding him guilty and he goes and dies a bloody, gruesome death. And on the cross, as he dies, he says, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. And so as I think about that story, I tear up because it's so beautiful to think that Christ gives us that exact model. Stephen gives us that exact model to follow. That we would day after day choose lives of steadfast faithfulness. And there are two people that I'm, I'm talking to today. There are some of you that are crushing it. There are some of you who walked in this room today who have been dying to yourselves every day, who have been serving faithfully. And I just wanna say way to go, way to go. And there's a second group and you came in here today and you're hearing this and you're saying, man, I want that to be me, it's just not me right now. And I'm just here to tell you, it can be you starting today. And uh, you know, Christ, Stephen had years to, to develop that courage and boldness and it just takes simple steps of obedience starting today. And so my prayer is that even to our last faithful breaths, we'd be able to stand and say, hey God, I am for you, I love you, I wanna make you known. May it be true of us today. Let me pray. Oh God, I'm so grateful for uh, your brother, Stephen, um, who is in heaven right now with the people who killed him with Paul. What a story of redemption, God. Um, God, I pray that we as your people Harris Greek, the people listening. God, would we be a people who are found faithful to you in our day to day? Would we, would we be a steadfast people that even if we face death, God, even if we face hard circumstances, God, we would choose to have your boldness and courage, that we would be empowered by your Holy Spirit in those moments. So God, I just pray as we go today, God, as we respond today, God, would you make our hearts full of your grace and mercy, full of your Holy Spirit, God, to embolden us, to go and make disciples across the ends of the earth, God, to take small, faithful steps of obedience. So God, I pray now as we sing, as we respond, would you have your way in us? In Christ's name, amen.